thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Saf. Uh, I'm the Chief Financial Officer for ScanCell. Uh, as Sue introduced, uh, ScanCell is a clinical stage immunotherapy company. Uh, we develop both cancer vaccines and antibodies. Our lead cancer vaccine is called SCIB1. And it's being developed for advanced melanoma. It's got some pretty compelling monotherapy data, as well as uh, data in combination with checkpoint inhibitors. We've got some near-term milestones coming up in half two of 2024, later this year. Hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have an appreciation of the science as well as the studies uh, and a clear idea of our upcoming milestones. By way of introduction, uh, ScanCell develops both cancer vaccines and antibodies. Why both? It's all about the adapted uh, immune system and stimulating potent T cells. Uh, that's really the expertise of our CEO and founder. Her name's Professor Lindy Durant. We are listed on AIM, which is a junior market on, in London. Uh, we're backed by Redmile and Volpe's, who own respectively 29 and 13% of the company. Late in 2023, we raised a further 12 million and we brought uh, in some further life science specialist investors which all leaves us quite well positioned to reach well beyond our near-term clinical milestones later this year. We've got opportunity to extend that even further. Uh, so our antibody portfolio is available for outlicensing. We've got five antibodies. One of those antibodies has already been outlicensed to GemMap. We received $6 million up front, and there's a further 624 in development milestones as it progresses. Uh, progress of that antibody called SE129 remains on track, uh, and so we do expect further milestones down the line. We've got a lean and experienced team. Uh, we have uh, the clinical team in-house, so we don't use CROs, allowing us flexibility and transparency in the studies. And we are now building our commercial capabilities and building our expertise to progress our assets into the late stage clinical studies that we're looking to do. Here's our pipeline, and this is a pipeline that shows our assets that are available uh, for development right now. As you can see, we've got multiple assets uh, in the pipeline, uh, all derived from our proprietary platforms. So we've got four proprietary platforms, uh, Immunobody, Moditope, Glimabs, and Avidimab. There's further details on our website. But as a small biotech, it's about organizational focus and capital allocation. That's why our focus is around the lead two cancer vaccines that we've got. SCIB1, iSCIB1, which I'll talk about mostly in this presentation, uh, and MODI1, uh, which is a peptide-based vaccine as well. The Glimabs uh, are available for, for partnering, uh, and we do strongly believe in the therapeutic potential of all of our assets. As I'm going to focus on SCIB1, uh, I didn't want to diminish uh, our other assets, so I'm going to just briefly talk to you about MODI. MODI is a peptide vaccine. Uh, it's uh, it's from a process called stress-induced translate post-translational modifications. There's a process called citrullination, where an arginine is converted into a citrullinine, which leads to nice neoantigens. Uh, and so we've got a peptide vaccine, MODI1, which is in a basket phase one, two study, and we're testing it in various solid tumors. It's shown good safety and tolerability. It's shown no dose limiting toxicity and some early efficacy. We're looking to put that into renal cell carcinoma in combination with double checkpoint inhibitors, and we expect data from that later this year. Our antibodies are from our Glimab portfolio. These are sugars that are expressed on normal cells uh, that are either upregulated or downregulated in stress conditions. And so they can make quite unique and highly specific targets. Uh, and we've Outlicensed one to GemMab already, but they also have potential for ADC, uh, for T cell redirecting, uh, and there's some early conversations about radiopharmaceuticals as well. So that antibody portfolio provides us some non dilutive funding that we can use to fund our other assets. So for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to focus on our lead cancer vaccine, SCIB1, and the second generation of it, iSCIB1. I'll talk to you very briefly about the science, then I'll show you the studies that we've got. So SCIB1 is a non-personalized DNA cancer vaccine. I think there's a combination of factors that make it quite unique and quite competitive in this space. SCIB1 uh, targets antigen-presenting cells in vivo, 
So it targets the cells that are already in your body, and that's compared to cell and gene therapy and CAR T, where you're injecting cells into the body. It's off the shelf, uh, so it is not personalized to, to individuals. Uh, that's our thesis, is about how you um, stimulate the right T cells and not necessarily always about the antigen that stimulates a response. Uh, it's delivered needle free. Uh, so we did look at electroporation. We explored it with electroporation. Getting DNA plasmids into the cells is a little tricky. That's why you usually have to uh, use electroporation. But we've partnered with a company called Pharmajet uh, and we found that their intradermal device, which is needle free, is working pretty well. And uh, uh, we've shown little toxicity in the studies that we've got. So the combination of these is what makes the immunobody platform and the SCIB, SCIB1 quite unique. Just to explain the science a little bit more. So SCIB1 is a DNA plasmid that encodes an antibody-like protein that you can see there. Uh, in the target binding areas of the antibody, we've got specific epitopes that are specific to melanoma. This is GP100 and TRP2. These are broadly expressed across melanoma and, and have been cloned from patients that have shown spontaneous regression uh, of their melanoma. So these are validated targets in the melanoma space. The FC component of the antibody is retained, and that's really what goes on to stimulate the, the right type of T cells, which I'll show you on the next slide. At this stage, I would say the epitopes that we've got uh, in the target binding region of the antibody is customizable. So we can put in different epitopes, different validated epitopes that target other therapies too. And one of those targets is NYESO, which is indicated in small cell lung cancer. So we do have a product called SCIB2 that we can go on to, to develop. Once we show efficacy, again, it's just about capital allocation. So this is the immunobody mechanism of action. The immunobody uh, in pathway one goes directly to antigen presenting cells where it's taken in by the antigen presenting cell processed and the known epitopes are expressed uh, on MHC one and two stimulating potent CD8 cells. So it's about stimulating the right type of high avidity T cell, potent T cells. The second pathway that happens is at the site of injection, uh, the DNA plasmid can go straight into smooth muscle cells uh, where the DNA uh, produces the antibody-like protein that circulates and goes and binds to the CD64 receptor on antigen-presenting cells, uh, and also getting internalized, uh, antigens processed and presented for potent CD8 T cells. And the science is the combination of pathway one and pathway two, the direct and indirect, is what increases the potency uh, of the avidity responses of T cells. All this, I think, leaves uh, SCIB1 as a competitive vaccine in the space. Uh, melanoma is pretty well established and there's some important trials going on, uh, particularly with Moderna and BioNTech, Moderna with their personalized vaccine. Uh, and I'll come on to, to explain how we're different and how we're positioning ourselves differently in, in a second. But personalized vaccines, whilst we believe will work and we hope will work, do pose some technical and uh, economic challenges. Each vaccine needs to be manufactured individually. And at least in the UK, uh, we do see some uh, feedback from the NHS hospitals about storing personalized vaccine for two years and making sure that they can uh, you know, logistically uh, treat the patient for two years. Whereas our vaccine is going to be off the shelf. So in the time that a personalized vaccine is going to take six weeks to biopsy, uh, run the algorithms, find the epitopes, develop the vaccine, and then get it manufactured, we think our vaccine will be available straight away. And if we can demonstrate similar, similar efficacy to these personalized vaccines, uh, we think it's a pretty compelling market. And what I would say about both personalized and non-personalized vaccines is uh, there's a school of thought now around combination with checkpoint inhibitors. And so we do believe if we can find the right product position and, you know, cancer vaccines working synergistically with the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, this can be a really compelling market and a really uh, a compelling option uh, to treating cancers. So now I'll talk about the studies. Um, so we did test uh, SCIB1 as a monotherapy. Uh, so this is the original study. Uh, and what we showed from our monotherapy study is uh, an efficacy signal. Um, so uh, on the left-hand side, you can see that we tested it in patients 
uh, with tumor present. So it's considered the li slightly later stage of the disease. Uh, and in patients with um, tumor present, in 15 patients, we showed 60% of those patients had stable disease. That is somewhat comparable to checkpoint inhibitors alone. On the right-hand side, you can see our monotherapy data in patients who did not have tumor present at the start of the study. And just to explain the, the chart that you can see, each of those red dots that you can see are resections. That's the surgeon going in and taking, uh, taking the tumor out as far as they can see it. So these patients all had high chance of reoccurrence. And as you can see, when they entered the study, the first 10 patients in the, in the, the, the teal color were immunized with Skib1 alone. And the first 10 patients were uh, disease-free and alive and well five years later. The next four patients that you can see in blue uh, did have a recurrence uh, and then went on to another form of therapy, so checkpoint inhibitors, uh, and they were also alive and well five years later. And unfortunately, two people succumbed to the disease. So 88% of patients uh, remained disease-free after five years. So I think that's pretty compelling efficacy signals. Um, it is in the earlier setting uh, for cancer vaccines. We do believe there's therapeutic potential in that vaccine. But what, what we would need to do is to do quite a large uh, study uh, and a five-year follow-up, which is a smaller biotech, is something that we're not financed for right now. Uh, and so we decided to think about a later stage disease setting and in combination with checkpoint inhibitors. So we will come back to the earlier setting because we think there's therapeutic potential, but we're pursuing a later stage disease at this stage. So this is the treatment landscape for unresectable melanoma. In that resectable melanoma space, um, that's the 88% data that we've shown. You can see Moderna and Merck have their neoantigen vaccine. We are targeting first line unresectable melanoma. The current standard of care in, in that setting varies a little bit, but it's normally the most efficacious uh, treatment is double checkpoints of EP and Nevo. And our thesis is to put our cancer vaccine in combination with EP and Nevo to see if we can improve the clinical outcomes for these patients. You can treat with anti-PD-1 alone and BRAF inhibitors. Uh, and there are some other studies, BioNTech and IOBiotech, that are testing their vaccines with Keytruder alone. Um, but we believe we're the only ones in this triplet therapy at the moment, where it's our vaccine plus IPI and Nevo. So that's the study we are doing right now. It's called the SCOPE study. It's recruiting stage three and four melanoma patients with unresectable melanoma uh, that uh, are suitable for treatment with IPI and Nevo uh, and have had no uh, advanced treatment, treatment for advanced disease. The study has been designed as a Simon II stage study to demonstrate non-futility. And so to demonstrate non-futility is to say we can achieve over and above what the double checkpoints achieve alone. Uh, and we've reported on the Simon stage one data, which I'll show you right now. Uh, and now we're in the second stage of that study. So when speaking to our principal investigators and our advisory board who was advising us, oncologists, uh, specialists in melanoma, uh, they believe the objective response rate for IP and Nevo is 50%. And what we're trying to achieve with this study is to increase that 50% to 70%, which will demonstrate a meaningful difference that our vaccine is adding to the efficacy of just the checkpoints alone. So this is the stage one data. What you can see on the left is a waterfall plot. Uh, and of the 13 patients we've re uh, reported on so far, 11 of those patients showed a uh, disease, um, disease regression. Um, so a 30% or more reduction in their tumor uh, as, as measured by Resist 1.1. One of the responders that we've reported on so far has shown a complete response. Patient number two, as you can see, did show a reduction in their tumor, but it's at 24%, so not at the magic 30% number, but stable disease, and one patient had progressive disease. That one patient who had pro progressive disease did have bulky tumor, M1C, but as you can see, patient nine and 10 also had bulky disease. So we can't see any differentiating factor or anything that would suggest we need to stratify this population. 
What you can see on the right hand side is the duration of response and we're demonstrating and we'll continue to follow these patients. These are durable responses. Uh, the current standard of care, AP and Nevo, uh, is about progression-free survival is about 11 and a half months and we'll follow up these patients for two years. But it's important to say the primary endpoint of this study is objective response rate. And as long as we can demonstrate above 70%, we will have enough of an efficacy signal to progress into a phase two, three adapted registration study. And we're currently at 85%. We're in the second stage of this study now. So SCIB1 uh, has monotherapy data and has um, uh, combination data in stage one. And so I just wanted to introduce iSCIB1+. iSCIB1 Plus is the second generation of SCIB1. SCIB1 has specific epitopes, and those epitopes are HLA2 restricted. So we do have to do a screen for those patients uh, to make sure that they're HLA2 positive before we can test uh, the SCIB1 vaccine. iSCIB1 Plus doesn't have the HLA restriction. So we can address 100% of the population. Uh, and we're, we're very confident with iSCIB1 Plus because it's got the same epitopes as SCIB1, just more epitopes that are not HLA2 restricted. It also has an extended patent life of 15 years. So it's very likely iSCIB1 Plus will be the vaccine that we take forward into registrational studies. iSCIB1 Plus has been approved to be added to our study as an additional cohort. And so recruitment is well underway in that cohort. And we expect to report on that data too at the end of this year. Off the back of the scope data, so considering SCIB1 and iSCIB1 Plus, we'll assess which of our products that we're going to pursue into a phase two, three adapted registration study, getting to the business end of things. So these are the milestones uh, coming up. Uh, we have SCIB1 with double checkpoint inhibitors, and we're waiting for uh, responses in 43 patients and to demonstrate above 70% overall response rate, we're at 85% and I skip one to report in 43 patients too. The MODIFY study should read out some clinical uh, data towards the end of this year, allowing, allowing us to position where we wanna put that peptide vaccine into development. And one of our antibodies for small cell lung cancer called TC134, uh, we'd love to take into the clinic ourselves. That's the one that we're excited about uh, and subject to partnering, financing and licensing conversations, we'd love to put that into the clinic too. So an exciting time for ScanCell, lots of clinical milestones coming up. And thank you for your interest and hopefully I've piqued your interest enough to, to follow us into our clinical data readouts in half two. I'll just end in the outlook, but happy to take any questions.